Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today's video is about my five months experience with the RAV4 Prime. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my impressions and the good and the bads about the RAV4 Prime. Uh, so a little bit about the charging, the battery capacity, heating, infotainment, cargo capacity, lighting, driving experience, um, and finally everything related to uh, battery issues. So I hope uh, you like my videos. If you do like them, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel. Uh, so let's get to it. So before starting, I just want to mention that these are my personal opinions uh, and my personal uh, experience with the RAV4 Prime. Uh, so that means all the conditions might not be exactly the same for you. It will depend on the model you have, where you live, on your driving habits. Uh, so for myself, I live in Montreal, Quebec in Canada. I own the RAV4 Prime XSE um, and I've had the RAV4 Prime since October 2020. Uh, so as of now, we are October, uh, sorry, February 24th, 2021. Um, and first topic will be charging the RAV4 Prime. So when it comes to charging the RAV4 Prime, um, I decided to buy the Grizzly charger uh, with 40 amperes. I believe it's made in Canada, in Ontario. Um, and why I chose that charger is, first of all, uh, having a level 2 charger is very useful for us. Um, it might not be the case for everyone else. Level 1 charger might be enough, 12 hours charging. So let's say you go for uh, go to work, come back, charge it overnight, and you're good to go. But someone like me who, um, well not myself, it's my wife who actually uses the car every single day. Uh, well after her commute, let's say we want to go out. Uh, let's say we want to run some errands. Anywhere we want to go outside the house, Having a level two charger allows us to, within an hour, charge half the capacity of the battery and have at least 30 to 35 kilometers that we can actually use. So that's very, very useful for us. And especially with uh, being, uh, I mean, living in Quebec, we do have a subsidy of $600 for the charger. So the Grizzly 40 amperes only costs us $700. So you do the math, it was so $100 that we have to actually pay from our pockets plus the installation that we had to hire an electrician uh, to actually do it. We did not need the smart Wi-Fi connected chargers itself um, because it's not a necessity for us. We didn't need to track the electricity or um, start the charging at a specific time. Uh, usually with the, four, with the char level two charger, you can charge your RAV4 Prime in two and a half hours, which is very practical. Um, and if you, ever need to actually control your charging times. So let's do the schedule and you don't need a smart charger for that. You can do it with the onboard settings on the RAV4 Prime. Uh, so you, you can go on the actual uh, infotainment, not the infotainment, the actual uh, dashboard and choose the schedule that you want to put in and the RAV4 Prime will charge according to that schedule. As for the battery capacity, um, for my experience, so that means my driving and um, the weather in Quebec, since I, since I got the car in October 2020, the weather was usually minus, I mean, not minus, plus 10, uh, 15, deg uh, 15 degrees Celsius. Um, and I would get around 75 or 80 kilometers driving, which is, which is pretty good. Uh, we were mainly driving uh, on eco mode most of the time. Uh, but for the winter, uh, we ended up with the, with the weather drop, with the snow, with the preheating, um, our range went from 75 to 80 to 55 to 60 kilometers. So like I said, it really depends on the driving you do. And, and it's pretty much like the same thing as a gas car. So depending on the, no matter how much liter you put in, you know, in your, in your car, usually it gives you an estimated range of how much you can drive. And that changes according to if you're using the heating, are you accelerating a lot? Are you braking really, you know, really hard? So all those go into, goes into account and gives you an approximate range. So the same thing applies with the EV. Uh, so according to the level of battery you have, the temperature outside, the temperature of the battery, how much the car thinks you can actually have as a range. Uh, so that's it for the battery capacity. Um, I, and I did mention a special word, 
and that's a hot topic right now, the heating for the RAV4 Prime. I know a lot of you folks have a lot of conversation about heating, um, but I don't want to make anyone jealous. Uh, from, but from my experience for heating, I have no issues whatsoever with the car. Uh, and especially the fact that I live in Quebec and we get very cold winters. I believe last week or the week before it was minus 25 degrees Celsius. Um, and why do I not have issues? Well, first, there's a lot of factors in this. Um, not the fact that, you know, uh, I can endure winter or the colds. That has nothing to do with that. It's the fact that my car is parked in the garage. So by having it parked in the garage, I can heat up the car very easily with the heat, heat pump only. Uh, so that's very easy. My garage is, is heated at 10 degrees, mm -hmm. 15 degrees. Um, so I can just simply start the car uh, with, the, with, the, with the application or with the, with the key fob. Uh, and then within 20 minutes, it's just heated up at the target temperature, which I usually set to 24 to 25 degrees Celsius. Um, in that case, the app is amazing to start the car. Um, you can just set the temperature you want um, and it, it will heat up the car up to that temperature. I've personally never had issues with the app itself, except when I first got the car and um, the first, few, I think first few weeks, then we got an update with the Android because uh, I do own an Android. So on the Android, we got an update and everything was working flawlessly. I do tend to get here and there are some issues with connection to the server, um, but I believe I got it three or four times in, uh, in five months. Um, so those are the good part of the heating. Uh, for me, it works well, uh, no issues with it. Some uh, people will have issues. If your car is parked outside, um, the heating will not be as effective. Anything under minus 10 degrees Celsius, the heat pump is not effective at all. There is a hit resistance heating in the car, um, but I believe it's 185 watts, so it's not going to do any good for heating a car. If you do want the engine to start, the actual combustion engine to start, you do need to install a third-party remote starter. And in that case, um, you will have to go um, install it elsewhere. Uh, the dealer does not do it from what I believe as of, yeah, as of yet. The only downside to that is you cannot start the combustion engine if your car is physically connected to the charger. Uh, so that's uh, a setback if you're installing a remote st uh, starter. Uh, the downside of the heating, um, I do find the steering wheel heating is not as great because it only heats on the side. So on the top and the bottom is not heated. So let's say you're using the steering wheel and you're actually turning, you can feel the hot spots and the cold spots. So I figured, you know, it's not, it's not a great experience. It's not, it's not a, I would not say it's a setback for the car, but it would have been nice if the whole steering wheel uh, was heated. Um, and also the fact that, you know, there's no way of starting the combustion engine would have been nice to have it. Um, I believe, you know, it could have been simply a, just an add-on on the remote application or on the key fob. Um, but I guess that those are the limitations of a plug-in hybrid and we'll have to live with it. So that's it for the heating. And uh, next up will be the infotainment system. So for the infotainment system, uh, I mainly have a lot of bads than goods. I'll start with uh, what's uh, the bad ones first. Um, reverse camera quality is pretty bad on the RAV4 Prime. I come from an Audi A3 2017, which did not have a reverse camera. So I'm not used to having a remote, I mean reverse camera. And I don't really have a lot of use for it, especially the number of times I actually use it. It's not that many. Um, but I've seen remote, reverse cameras on other cars, on, especially on colleagues and on friends. Um, and this one is pretty bad. So um, that's one of the downsides I have. And also the fact that not only the quality is bad, most of the time in winter it's just not usable because it's always covered in mud or in snow or ice. So it uh, would have been nice to have some kind of spray. Every time you spray your windshield washer, maybe some spray to actually go on the camera itself would have helped. But uh, it's, it's a little you know, downside for it, um, for the reverse camera. Uh, the second thing I don't like uh, for the infotainment system is the fact that you have to use the touchscreen experience. 
like I said, I come from an Audi A3 where everything was done with the joystick. So even when you're driving, you kind of know what you're doing even with the joystick because you don't have to look at the screen. You don't even have to touch it. Everything is click and with the, I think it's a knob, you just turn it. So it would have been nice to have some kind of experience which is not touch because um, the first time I started using the RAV4 Prime in the touch screen, it's, it's not responsive. Uh, sometimes I know you don't, I know folks, I know you're going to tell me that you're not supposed to drive and touch the screen, but let's say even if you're not driving and you park and you want to put in some address or use Waze, sometimes it's, it's not as responsive and you have to press the buttons once or twice to actually get the, um, the actual menu you want to go to. Uh, so it would be nice to have um, a joystick or some kind of different experience, but I do love the actual uh, physical buttons where you can just press maps and it goes straight to your favorite map, which could be Android, I mean, uh, Waze or Google Maps. So that's, that's really amazing. So that works really well. Um, another thing I really enjoy is the fact that when you long press the voice command, it doesn't, uh, just pressing it once, I think, I believe it starts the Toyota voice command but long pressing it actually goes to the Google one, which is amazing. So if you have Android Auto plugged in, Google Assistant turns on and it's just uh, works really amazing well. Um, the other thing I do not like is the fact that there's no way of connecting Android Auto or Apple CarPlay except via the USB at the front. So it's really unfortunate because, uh, like I said, in my Audi, I could have connected any USB that was available and I could have used Android Auto. In this case, I, only, I can only plug it in the front. So one of the issues with that is, first of all, if you have a long cable, you have a really long cable in the front and it's dangling everywhere and it's not as practical and it's not as clean as I would love to. So let's say you don't want a long cable, well, bet you get a short cable. Yeah, I could do that too. But the issue is, let's say I park my car and I'm waiting for someone, let's say to pick up my wife, I cannot use my phone because it's, the cable is too short. So I have to disconnect the cable, use my phone, and let's say I'm ready to drive, connect it back. So that's not really um, practical in that case. So I would love to see uh, some kind of cable, um, I mean connection at, on the middle console. So I can plug in Android Auto or Apple CarPlay um, on any USB cable. So now let's talk about cargo capacity and lighting. Um, first of all, I like I said, I come from an Audi A3, so a very small car. So for me, the cargo capacity is just, you know, a lot. So I can put a lot of stuff now uh, since it's an SUV. But I did compare to a, a, a few of our other folks uh, and friends who have uh, SUVs, so the CRV and other cars. I do believe they're relatively the same size, uh, maybe a few different. Um, but having folding seats really does help. Um, I've been to IKEA recently. I've been buying a lot of uh, a few furniture, so having you know uh, the capacity of actually folding them and putting them, you know as I would flush, it was just amazing. I believe the configuration is 60-40, but you know, it just works out really well. Um, cargo capacity is good, but getting to the cargo capacity, I mean the cargo, that's another story. So I do have the XSE model. Um, so I have the motorized uh, trunk opener, which is very painfully, very slow. So it takes a lot of time to actually close and actually open. Um, so I would prefer to have something faster, uh, if that was possible, or even do it manually, if, if anything. So I know the XSC model and the XSC tech has the motorized and the SC model, you guys don't have the uh, motorized. So I would say you guys are the lucky one uh, with the, having the manual one. Um, so that's one downside. It's not a big issue, but it's just, uh, would have been nicer to be faster. Um, another aspect would be, um, since I started using the cargo a little more, I've been putting a lot of stuff in the bag without even thinking how dirty it would get. So the carpet there tends to get dirty pretty fast. Um, so I ended up buying a cargo liner, um, which is amazing because not only it covers the back, the cargo space, but also the back seat. So when you fold in the back seat, the whole area is covered, so nothing gets dirty. 
So right now you can see it on a few of my shots, shots um, the cargo liner is actually pretty dirty. So all that dirt would have been on the actual carpet in the back. So if you guys can get that, it does not come standard. Uh, so you do have to buy it. I believe it's $160, I believe, uh, Canadian dollars. And uh, you can get it at your dealer. Uh, and the one from the RAV4 hybrid fits on the RAV4 Prime. So it's the same one. As for the lighting, another deception for the lighting, I was expecting a 2021 vehicle to come mostly with LED lighting inside, not at all. So you have your old yellow bulbs coming in at the halogen ones. Um, so I ended up changing all of it. So the vanity, the middle console, the back, the trunk lighting, um, just make sure you get good quality LEDs. You don't want to burn out your system or you don't want some that you have to keep replacing uh, over time. Uh, so read the reviews on Amazon and get some uh, good ones. I will be posting the links for the ones I got uh, in the description below. Um, so that's for the LEDs. And another issue is the lighting itself. Um, I had a lot of issues uh, trying to turn on the lighting from my windows and uh, the lock. You know, so all the console you have. Uh, to control your windows on the driver's side, I, was, I had a lot of trouble finding the lights, only to find out that there are no lights. So that was a big issue for me because it's very practical when you have light because you know exactly where to press. I, I, a few times I, have to pick, I had to pick up my wife and I didn't know how to unlock the doors because I couldn't see where the door unlock was. So I had to actually use my flashlight, my phone's flashlight to actually figure that out. Um, so it's not a big deal, like I mentioned, but it is very unpractical. It's not practical at all. And even the top ones, you know, when you have, uh, if you do have a sunroof or if you want to turn on the light to actually open the door, you even have to guess with that one too. So by practice, after a few times, you kind of tend to know where they are. Um, but at night it's really not practical. So I know it's, it's not a big deal because, uh, Toyota could have done it. Uh, they do it on their Camry, which is exactly the same part you can replace. So you can take the one from the Camry, put it in the RAV4 Prime, and it works. I still haven't done it. Uh, I will be doing it very soon, and I'll be posting a video about it. But that's an op I mean, that's a decision that the Toyota made, uh, which, you know, they try to save a few dollars there, but it's really not practical. As for the driving light itself, the headlights are amazing. LEDs, it's my first car that has LEDs. Um, I used to have HIDs only. Uh, so having LEDs, it's just amazing. They're very bright, they're very responsive. Um, I did end up changing anything that was halogen. So um, the turn signals um, were still all bulbs. So I ended up putting LEDs instead. And also the reverse lights, they were pretty dim. Um, so I ended up changing those two uh, to LEDs. I believe they're 4000K um, color. So it's more in the white and less of the yellow color uh, for the reverse lights. So that's it for the lighting and the cargo capacity. Uh, next up would be the driving experience and also um, a hot topic, which is battery issues. So, for my driving experience, um, I've really enjoyed driving the RAV4 Prime since I got it. Um, going from a gas car to a EV car, a plug-in hybrid uh, car, it's, it's day and night. So you do feel the experience of having instant power, instant torque, uh, you know, when you press the pedal versus, you know, the gas model uh, or gas cars where, you know, you do have that, you know, micro millisecond of delay uh, within pressing the uh, accelerator. Um, and not only that is, you know, you barely have to pay gas, you know. Like I said, most of my commute or most of my wife's commute is local. So for us, you know, we don't even have to, you know, pump gas at all anymore, except for the long trips we do. So driving experience, really good. I did test drive a, a Tesla uh, before buying uh, the plug-in hybrid. So I kind of got the same feeling, you know, the instant power. So I was really pleased with that. As for winter driving in Quebec, um, we do get a lot of snow. Uh, I think in the winter, we uh, this winter, we got some days 20, 25 centimeters, one shot. So uh, no issues at all. All wheel drive, um, instant power when you need it. You do need to have good sets of uh, winter tires. So I have the Blizzak DMV2. 
I, en I ended up downsizing my sides. Uh, so I had the XSC uh, model, which comes with the 19 inch. So I went to the 18 inch instead, uh, downsizing a little bit, you know, actually helps with the traction. Um, so no issues whatsoever, never got stuck in the snow, uh, but I did try to turn off the traction control and see, uh, play a little bit with the car, but the car itself is, is a little too smart. So it tends to send power more in the front wheel than afterwards in the back if it's needed, uh, but it's more prominently the front wheel drive. Um, but what you can do is to see where the power is being sent, you do have a screen um, in the dashboard where it shows you where the power is being uh, distributed. So you can see if it's going to the front wheel, if it's going to the back, if you, one of your build, uh, uh, wheel is stuck, so you can see you know, how the car is reacting. So that's a really great feature to have to actually, actually see where the power is going. Um, one thing I dislike about the, uh, the driving is all the different modes that they are. Um, when I first got the car, it was very confusing for me because you had the EV, you had the Auto EV HV, you had the HV mode, and then you have the Charge Hold mode. So obviously, the more you drive, the more you get to know the car, it's much easier for you to choose the mode you want. Like myself now, I just always go for EV mode uh, when I need to. But when I'm doing long trips or when I'm going on the highway, I tend to put more on HV to use a little more the, uh, the gas engine and preserve the battery for when I want to do local driving. Uh, so that's for long trips, but when it's only local driving, I use EV 100%, so I never have to, uh, I never use any other modes. Uh, so that was initially confusing, but like I said, uh, just taking, you know, uh, it'll take you a few weeks to actually figure that out and feel the car and a little bit, you know, what it does. When does the engine start? Once the engine starts, you know, you have a whole cycle it needs to go through before going back to EV. So you might think, hey, how come it's not going back to EV? So getting used to that, uh, you know, uh, it'll be fine after. Um, another thing I hate about the driving is the reverse sound. Uh, like everyone mentions, it, it does sound like an alien ship. Um, but there's a good reason behind it, which I totally agree with. Um, and I believe most of the uh, EV cars or plug-in hybrids will all have mandatory, uh, have these noises. So from what I read is legislation that will soon pass, I believe, by Transport Canada for uh, blind people or people with the hearing disabilities where uh, electric cars or plug-in hybrids barely make any noise when they drive, right? Because they don't have an engine anymore that's running. So compared to a regular gas car, it makes a lot of noise when the engine is running. So you know people know you're there, they can see you, or it, you're just more noticeable. But when you have an electric car, all that flies away because you know you don't have an engine running. You only have an electric motor, which barely make any sounds. So for people with people who are blind who rely on sounds, or people with hearing disabilities, you need to have some kind of feature where you know you can alert them that you're you're present. So if you noticed when you're driving until 30 or 40 kilometers, you do have that same noise, um, that humming noise that actually pl is played by the RAV4 Prime. And when you press on and you put on reverse, that volume just, you know, gets increased to 200% and everyone just, you know, looks at you and they're just staring at you looking at, oh, where's that sound coming from? So I would have preferred maybe having the control on the volume. Um, it is nice to, you know, to get noticed, you know, that you have an electric car. Okay, great. You know, you have the RAV4 Prime, but sometimes it's also, you know, a little disturbing when, you know, just everyone just turns around and to look at you. Um, and lastly, um, it would have been nice to have uh, the number of turn signals when you do a soft turn. Uh, not a soft turn, uh, when you press uh, once on the blinkers, you get an, an amount of blinkers, you know, the turn signal, right? So you get three signals, I believe, three times, you know, it blinks three times. Would have been nice to have it at least for four or five times. In my old car, you could have changed it with the OBD. I think you can do it with uh, Toyota as well. But it's just the fact that it would have been just much easier if you put in the infotainment system where you can actually go and change the, the options. Because three times, usually it's not enough, you know? Most people want four or five times. It's just much easier when you're in a highway or um, when you don't want to think about, you know, uh, putting it back to turn off your blinker. So that's it for all the um, 
all the impressions. Next up would be uh, to discuss about the batteries and the battery issues that most people are having. So for the battery, uh, I read a lot on the forums that a lot of people are having issues with the batteries. Uh, the 12 volt battery, uh, getting a lot of uh, you know uh, errors on the dashboard. The hybrid system is failure, and you get a bunch of Christmas lights. You get everything lit up. Um, not to make anyone jealous, I did not have any of those issues in the past five months. Nothing whatsoever. Well, first of all, uh, these cars are shipped from Japan, uh, so they go. They come in a boat. They get dropped out in Vancouver uh, for Canada, so the West Coast. They sleep there for a while, come by train, drop to the dealership. So as you can imagine, the batteries are usually dead um, or they're, barely, they're about to die. So when I got my car, I think the reading was, I think, 11.8 or 11.9. So which is, the dad is completely dead. But it still managed to start and it worked. But I ended up buying a smart charger. Uh, so thanks for the recommendation by Bruno who uh, in the forum who recommended to buy the uh, Noka Genius 2, which is a smart charger. So when I first got the car, I ended up charging the actual 12 volt battery to bring it back to life and, you know, have a proper charge at 12.6 or 12 12.7. Um, so my first advice would be charge. If you do have a smart charger, charge your car. If you don't have one, uh, the car will charge it for you, but you know you have to give it a chance to actually do so. If you leave the car in accessory mode, your battery will drain and it will die. So that's real one thing, because since the car does not have an alternator, you have to let it, you know, you cannot use the car in accessory mode if you just parked and you know, really listen to the radio. You have to be in ready mode. So that's when you start the car and it says ready. That's when you know the car, the hybrid battery, is charging the toggle battery. Um, so besides that, no other issues. Um, there is also an issue, I believe, on the drainage. Um, the RAV4 Prime does have that. Uh, there is a TSB, so a technical service built-in provided by Toyota, uh, sent to the dealership, where you can bring in your car and they can do a firmware update, a software update. update. And that should fi fix some of the issues of the drainage. So that means uh, the battery being drained even if you're not using it. So that's one of the issues. I still haven't done that on mine. I will do, I'll be doing it on my next service. Uh, but if you're having those issues, call your dealer um, and mention that first. Um, I'm not saying you should be charging your car to fix the, the issues you have. If you have any issues, go to your dealership first. But if you do want to also prevent any issues happening in the future and you do want to have a smart charger, well, get the Genius Noco 2 and charge your battery. Um, depending on how much you use the car too, because that's another issue. If you're not, if you're in the same situation as some other people, where COVID situation, you're working from home, you're not using a car anymore. Well, the battery will die out eventually. So having a smart charger will help you in the long run. So, would I choose the Rav4 Prime if I have to go over everything all over again? My answer is yes. Um, like I said, uh, I've been wanting to switch to an electric vehicle for a long time, but I wasn't ready to actually jump on it. Um, first of all, I didn't want to be um, planning all my trips uh, to see where the chargers are. So I wasn't ready to go 100% EV. So this was a, a good, you know, uh, in between for me, plug-in hybrid, having the liberty to actually, you know, run on EV for most of my commute. And whenever I was going for a long trip, let's say, you know, go to Toronto to visit family or go hiking. So go like, you know, one to three or two hours, you know, far from Montreal or even drive across Canada, go to Western Canada. I had that possibility without having to, you know, planning all the logistics of finding a charger and plan and charging it. Um, and also I did think about Tesla as well, uh, but seeing all the quality assurance issues they have, their paint coming off, uh, no offense to anyone owning Tesla, it's a great car, you know, obviously uh, Tesla has been, you know, pretty pioneering on this electric vehicle. Um, but it's just, I wasn't ready to go into uh, a complete EV as of yet. And especially, there's no other SUV, I would say, in the segment that can offer a towing capacity of 2,500 pounds. A daily commute in EV with, like, capabilities of 70 kilometers and have a reliable 
brand with several years of experience in the hybrid system, which is Toyota. So for me, that was pretty much the deal breaker into going with, uh, with Toyota and the RAV4 Prime. That's it, folks. I hope you liked the video. Uh, so these are my, my experience, uh, my personal experience, and also my impressions after five months of using the RAV4 Prime. Um, if you have any comments, uh, if you have any suggestions for any other videos I should be doing, uh, please write them below in the comment section. Please do uh, understand that this is my personal experience. Um, this might differ from what you have, whether you're living in the United States, anywhere else in the world, or in Canada. So according to your driving habits, the temperature you have it there, and all the um, subsidies you have, in Quebec, we do get um, a thirteen thousand dollars subsidy to actually buy the car, and a six hundred dollars subsidy to get the level two charger. So those are big factors for us to actually buying the car as well. So that might differ from uh, where you live. And also, uh, I know the options are somewhat different too, uh, depending on where you are. I have the XSC version, so if you want to find more information, you can go to Toyota, uh, the Canadian website of Toyota, which is Toyota.ca and check out what are the options I have. I did not add anything extra. It's pretty much the uh, XSE version with uh, the RAV4 Prime. The only extra thing I added was the cargo liner. All right, thank you everyone for watching the video. Uh, and I'll see you next time.